the political side of it, and then there's the real story. There's a lot to unpack right there. It wasn't quite the interview I thought that was going to be. There's a reason for it. This will be officially my favorite podcast I've ever done. Let's start off about Philadelphia, because I don't know uh, what you're a fan of, but I grew up a Pittsburgh Steelers fan, so did Jason. Are you an Eagles <laughs> fan or a Steelers fan? Look, I mean, when you're growing up in the Philadelphia area, I mean, you pretty much, you get, you, you know, you're, you're in the bassinet, and then you get handed your Eagles jersey, you get handed your Phillies hat. I mean, it's just kind of how it goes. It comes to the territory. So, yeah, we bleed green over there. There, there you go. Uh, at Boston, Scott is a friend of mine, and uh, I got to go see the Super Bowl this year. And it was a weird thing because Lee Steinberg's a friend, and he's uh, Patrick's agent. And then I had Boston mm. Scott out there, so I was like, okay, whoever wins, I'm happy. Um, but I'm sorry <laughs> yeah. that they didn't pull it out this year for you. Uh, yeah, so, well, when you got the refs in your corner, you know. <laughs> there you go. So you uh, are a United States Navy veteran. I always have to call out my sure. father, who served in two tour tours of Vietnam. He was a CB. He, C he was in Da Nang. Um, and... Uh, and uh, we thank you for your service. I obviously think it's an incredibly big deal that you were in the Navy. What what uh, got you uh, wanting to be in the Navy? How did how did that happen? Yeah, it's what got me into the Navy. So, I guess you know it's it's interesting because uh, both my grandfather served in the military. Um, my my on my father's side um, was Army. My my mother's side was Navy. Both was during the war. But, you know, it, it wasn't something that continued after um, after that. Served during the war, got out, and it wasn't really part of the lives afterwards. And then with the, uh, with the rest of my family, we didn't really have any other military service. But for me, it was I sort of got in backwards, I would say, to the Navy. Because all the way back during the War on Terror, when that was going on, that was the huge uh, topic of the day. A couple years after 9-11, everybody's focused on the Middle East. Um, I was in college at the time and everybody's talking about, well, you got to go learn Arabic. You got to go learn Farsi. These are the, the languages that you need to know. These are the, this is the area we're going to be totally focused on. This is the fight, the civilizational crisis. And I'm, and I'm not downplaying any of that. But what I'm saying is that that was really the, uh, the topic du jour of the time. I kind of had a different outlook and I said, there's, there's clearly, obviously, a very imminent threat here. But I think there's also potentially something else that I might also be interested in. And that of that at the time, this is going back 2005, 2006, was the rise of China. And a lot of people were talking about China in the wake of 9-11. Um, but for whatever reason, I just kind of noticed that in every story that I was looking at, whether it be uh, foreign trade, whether it be international politics, it seemed like China just kept coming up and up and up. And so I eventually... Uh, embarked on a State Department, sort of like a two-week tour of China when I was in a summer program when I was in, um, in, in college at Temple University, and then eventually had the opportunity to do a, a study abroad there for my final semester. Um, ended up staying, basically, and living in China and working at the American Chamber of Commerce, you know, low man on the totem bowl kind of place. But lived in Shanghai for about two years, um, learned to speak and read Mandarin Chinese, and then had the opportunity to stay. But also, for me, I thought that I wanted to come home and find a way to put whatever I had learned about China um, to good use. And so I, I flew home, you know, towards the end of 2008, and uh, basically started connecting with the U.S. Navy right after that because. To me, when you look at it from a military perspective, when you look at it from a geostrategic perspective, any any conflict or any engagement between the U.S. and China would definitely be Navy driven. Uh, at the time, it was called U.S. Pacific Command. Now it's Indo-Pacific Command because we've incorporated India into that COCOM. But it really was this, this interest and focus on China and the Chinese Communist Party and looking to find a way to put those skills to service for the country that uh, that led me basically to the Navy. And I told them, I said, look, uh, I, I want to get into the Navy. I want to do Intel. And, uh, you know, if it doesn't work out here, then I'll try the Army office next. If that doesn't work, I'll try the Marine Corps office and et cetera. But, you know, the Navy said, well, I'm more than happy to have you. And, uh, you know, I did everything, did everything backwards. But um, 
you know, was able to do a number of deployments uh, throughout East Asia, was able to put my language skills to good use while in the Navy, but then also ended up, uh, funny enough, because I, I started this talking about the, you know, the war on terror and how I thought that there was something else I wanted to study. Well, of course, uh, Navy knows best and anyone who's who's dealt with the military or the Department of Defense, the Pentagon in general knows that, you know, the needs of the Navy come first. So, of course, they also decided to completely flip my my skill set for about a year of my life and send me on a deployment to Guantanamo Bay. And then while I was at Guantanamo Bay, they attached me as uh, an intelligence analyst to the uh, interrogation cell there at the Human Operations Center. And uh, you know, people people have seen the movies. It's definitely, uh, definitely not the Hollywood version, I suppose I can say. But I was able to have that experience and also uh, be able to look at what a Guantanamo Bay interrogation looks like, be able to see how it's, it's again, not the Hollywood version, um, but also come face to face with some of those uh, some some pretty radical individuals who were there at the time, shall we say. Did you get to meet Jessica Chastain? Just kidding. <laughs> no, 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 no. Didn't, didn't, didn't have the pleasure. Yeah, um, sort of all over the map a little bit, but like, <clears throat> and you might have covered a little bit of this. I, I, I mean, maybe I lost my mind, but, uh, you know, you got an IMBD account. Like, what happened with Jackie Chan? <laughs> so this is my sort of, yeah, this is, I guess, like my fun fact at parties. And believe it or not, the a Hollywood company that was, and of course I'm dunking on Hollywood, now I'm talking about Hollywood, that was working in China at the time, a film production studio, uh, was making a movie called The Forbidden Kingdom. And they said, hey, we're looking for Americans who can play some roles in this film. It's a Jackie Chan movie, and actually it's going to be the first movie that has Jackie Chan and Jet Li in it. And they were looking for people that might want to appear on camera as Americans for a few scenes that they needed for uh, for American characters. It's one of those movies where like, uh, you know, a kid's getting beat up by a gang and then he learns Kung Fu and then he comes back and beats up the gang. You know what I mean? Yeah. The, you know, a lot of them, a lot of them kind of follow that, that formula. And it's an homage to a lot of the older, you know, sort of Kung Fu movies back in the day. So. Uh, I tried out for it. A bunch of us tried out for it in my program that uh, that they reached out to, and I ended up getting the part. And so, yeah, I got to be in this movie with. Uh, and and you know, it's funny because on online sometimes people pull it up the you know the clips of me. You know, they say, "Oh, Posobiec was trying to be an actor. Posobiec was doing this." And it's like I, I've never hit that. I've never hit, never tried to hide that. So yeah, it ended up being one of the opportunities that um you know that went out for when i was in china and yeah i got to meet jackie chan got to meet um basically the whole crew actually believe it or not the the girl who plays sort of the love interest in the film bill be Fay, then went on a couple of years later to play mulan in disney's big uh, live oh, wow. action mulan film so got it that's sort of my you know six degrees of kevin bacon there <laughs> with with mulan apparently we're we were in a movie together and and also uh, had the opportunity to work with so and 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 I mean very briefly, just not you know anything to you know he certainly wouldn't remember. But the the fight choreographer for the film was a guy by the name of Yuan Wu Ping. Now, if you're into Hong kung fu movies, you're into the Hong Kong movie scene, you might know Yuan Wu Ping. If you're not, um, you can go and pull him up on IMDb because you will recognize definitely every single movie that you see on this guy's page all the way back to Drunken Master, which was the original Jackie Chan movie, Drunken Master 2 back in the 70s, um, all the way up to movies that got much more widespread US Those attention. are my favorite. Crouching We're Tiger, Hidden <laughs> Dragon. Yeah, yeah, no. Yeah. And it's, Sorry. well, so crouching, he does the Crouching Tigers, he does Kill Bill 1, he does yeah. Kill Bill 2, oh, yeah. and... Uh, all the Matrix movies, every, the, the actual guy who did all the choreography. And it's funny that you mentioned that because everybody notices the, you know, the facial expressions, right? The facial expressions in those Kung Fu movies are so expressive. Everybody wants every single person all around the world. When they see those movies, they want to imitate them. I've got a five year old kid. I put something on like that. He does it immediately. Mm -hmm. Well, when we were on set, he would have sort of a, a, a like his assistant would kind of work out the punches, the kicks, the jumps, the spins, all that. And they'd be training on that all day. Meanwhile, 
the master would kind of just be sitting in a corner by himself, you know, watching little little clips of it on. We didn't have tablets at the time, but it's basically like an early version of a tablet where they go over and show it to him. But then when he came on the set, the one thing that Yuan Wuping really drove into and and impressed upon the actors was the facial expressions. Every single facial expression that you see in one of the fights in the movie was handed to them by Yuan Wu Ping because he was, you know, this is, you know, you're shocked. And, and he wasn't even, you know, he would just make the expression. He wasn't like talking. Uh, he would just say, this makes you excited. This makes you, now you're scared. Now you're uh, surprised, whatever it is. Now you're angry. He was giving all the way down to the minute details of, you know, this much nostril, this much, um, you know, uh, eyebrow raise. That's what he would be doing on the set. And it was incredible to see because he would walk you through this range of emotions, which, of course, when everybody watches a Jackie Chan movie, when everybody watches any of those films, uh, Keanu Reeves is famous for this throughout all of the Matrix. You realize that all of that down to the very minute detail is being choreographed by Yuan Ping, And that's why he is the master. We, um... We are coming up on the 24 election. It's going to happen very quickly. The, the ball's rolling. Um, I was sitting someone uh, with someone recently very high up in the Republican Party. And, I mean, extremely high up. And he said to me, there's no doubt that Trump will be the nominee for the Republican Party. Like, how do you handicap this? I know you're a friend of Donald Trump's. Like, how do you handicap what I can't... Every <laughs> Every time I think I understand what's happening, I learn that I have no idea what's happening. Um, for a person to be, I think, I think indicted twice in a sitting, a, a former president, it, the, it, to me, everything's upside down. I, it doesn't even make any sense anymore. I, it's like we're trying to torture ourselves. We're trying to ruin uh, the greatest democracy in history. Um, and I would be curious, and Jason, I'm sure you have, Maybe your thoughts around this before he, Jack answers, but if you got a question you want to chime in there, what do you think is going to take place if you had to, you know, since you're a Hollywood guy and a former actor, uh, or still an actor, I'm teasing you, Jack. Um, <laughs> what, do you, what do you think this soap opera looks like next year? Go ahead, Jack. I, I'm interested to hear what you say. Okay, well, I, you know, I, I'll agree with that. And I think as, as it sits right now, we're about, what, 15 months mm. until Election Day. 15 months is not a long time. Uh, no. It's, it's really a shootout. And the convention will be coming up in, in one year's time. But, of course, the primaries start much before that. They start in <clears throat> January. So when you really look at this, we're five months out from the first votes being cast. And five months is not a long time, certainly no. not in presidential politics these days and in, in politics in general, which I, I, I argue that, you know, uh, they say the national pastime is baseball. I would argue that it's, it, you know, it stopped being baseball a long time ago. Now the national pastime is politics. You know, so everything is politicized, everything from a movie to an actor to uh, music, TV shows, everything's political. The, it is our new favorite national pastime. It's what we argue about, it's what we bicker about, it's what we constantly talk about. This is now the new element of America, which you know, I, I suppose you could also argue it from a civic standpoint that it's good, but hopefully with the same prospect of Americans working together to hopefully better the country now, which obviously isn't always the case. It sometimes it seems more like we just want to beat the other side rather than putting putting the car before the horse. But uh, well, what I would handicap as we sit right now, I mean, to me, it looks like it, it looks like President Trump has it locked up, certainly in the primary. Uh, you look at the trajectory of the polls, you look at the trajectory on predict it right now, which is the betting markets in terms of this. Um, it doesn't seem like any of the other candidates have really found a lane or found an opening on him. Now, I suppose the asterisk is that well, you know, because, you know, and I talk to people about this as well, and they say, they say, oh, well, here's the thing. And I talk to the Santa supporters all the time, and they'll say, well, once Trump is indicted for this thing, when it indicted for that thing, that'll be the one that really, you know, that's the straw that breaks the camel's back. And I guess what I would say is when it comes certainly to Trump's core supporters, that you, this is a guy who's been under investigation since, you know, he's always under investigation. There's always some investigation. There's always some 
uh, prosecutor. There's always some lawsuit, even back when he was in his business days. So I think to an extent, the, the Trump brand already has it priced in that he's going to be there's there's going to be courtroom drama involved in it. Right. In the same way that there's always going to be you know everything with the apprentice and the boardroom and you're fired. This this has always been part of the Donald Trump brand. And so because people have it priced in, it doesn't affect him the same way it would someone who's been a career politician. And so the question, of course, coming up, well, what about, all right, so what, so Trump's the nominee, let's say Biden's the nominee, uh, barring any, you know, physical uh, ailments, shall we say, uh, when it comes to Biden, you know, which, and, and to be fair, right, there could be physical ailments uh, to Trump. I mean, they're, these are both older gentlemen, and it would be, it would be unfair to say that it isn't, but, you know, I think we all know that Biden seems to be, seems to be a little bit more long in the tooth than Trump is, that uh, when it comes to the general election, I think there's something different between Biden being the incumbent and Trump being the challenger. It's it's almost like the roles are reversed from where they were. And America's in a very different place in 2023 than it was in November of 2020. Keep in mind, November 20, uh, most of the country was still under lockdown. People didn't know what was going on with COVID. People were, some people were freaked out. Some people were making fun of the people who were freaked out. Uh, there was a lot of just mistrust out in the system. And I yeah, there was a lot of Biden fear campaign at the time. Yeah. And, and so the Biden campaign used that to say, OK, Trump is the one that's causing this. Trump is the one because he's so abnormal. He's he's so outside the normal sphere of politics and and, and the type of leader that we have in Washington. Don't you want a guy like like Uncle Joe, like Uncle Joe who has been there for 50 years, who was Barack Obama's wingman. Don't you want a guy like that to return us back to the normal state of things? And so the, I think there were people that were swayed by that argument in the grips in the midst of that COVID fear. But here's the problem, that's gone away. They don't have that anymore. And what they do have is an economy that's completely tanking. They've got a recovery that hasn't happened. They've got inflation that's through the roof. We're embroiled in a proxy war with Russia that I don't think anybody voted for. And people are asking what's gonna happen. There's a, a nuclear power plant that might get blown up. The American soldiers are you know, constantly discussed as being uh, deployed to Ukraine. I don't think anybody wants to get in a war I hope that nobody wants to get in a war, that Americans don't want to get into a ground war with the world's largest nuclear power. Like you said, Jack, it's a totally different playing field now. And uh, the Fed can't get inflation under control. 2% is the goal. Good luck with that. Um, geopolitically, Trump didn't start any new wars. Like you said, we have issues in Ukraine. We've given them uh, at least $100 plus billion plus while we're suffering at home. The middle class is being uh, destroyed. And we're going to have uh, real estate issues too, Airbnbs, uh, commercial real estate. Because of COVID, most people had transitioned to working remotely. They actually even moved. Californians moved to Boise, Idaho. They were able to find uh, uh, great deals in housing outside of the state of California. Then they're being recalled by Fortune 100 companies to come back to work. So you've had a lot of bubbles in real estate that are just starting to now show their face. Austin, Texas, Boise, Idaho, a lot of places there. And Trump was uh, one thing that he did very well was he was very strong with the economy. And, you know, if his uh, team um, kind of coaches him to tweet less or in this case, I guess, Truth Social, if he just kind of just reins it in a little bit from that standpoint, that's really only his weak Link pretty much all of the country knows that there's been a weaponization of the three letter agencies most recently. And um, based on some outcomes that are currently going on and have occurred, they see that there's a bias kind of baked in there. So, uh, yeah. is there a question in there? No, I just, I just <laughs> wanted to. I, well, I do have a question yeah. actually for uh, for Jack. It's to kind of switch gears a little bit, Jack, because you're, uh, I believe you're of Polish descent. Um, in a, in uh, Europe right now, and I noticed you wrote a book, the Antifa stories from inside the black box. I'd like to get your take on France right now, if you would. What are you seeing there? Why is it, what what is actually happening in your opinion? Yeah, so France is is an interesting situation. I would I would call it multifactorial because in it, with the French riots, which you know, and it's it's kind of interesting to tell whether or not the French riots are still going on because Macron has most recently 
actually shut down internet in a few of the areas where people have been posting these videos up to Snapchat, people have been posting them to, um, to Instagram, other areas, but now it's been shut down. So we can't even really get good fidelity as to whether or not the rights are still happening at night. Uh, essentially, you had a version of events that closely followed the same type of riots that we saw in the U.S. in 2020 with the George Floyd riots. Now, the question, of course, has the French government cracked down on it? It, it looks like they may have, um, but I'm still not quite sure I can come out and say that fully. So what you had was a situation where a police officer uh, was involved in an active shooting regarding a driver who was, and if you look at the video, uh, it looks like he's putting the officer's life in danger by basically trying to run him over. His partner discharges his firearm, shoots the driver, kills him. But because he was of Algerian descent, you had this massive population. And people don't understand the level of mass immigration that France has seen from North Africa and places like Somalia over the past 25 to 30 years. You have, so you have these huge areas of France and, and years ago, people used to refer to them as no-go zones, which are, I mean, you go into them and they're not French, they're, they're Algerian, these are Muslim areas. Uh, these are people from Africa that are now living with huge populations inside of France. And so those areas viewed this as sort of a wider flashpoint and a wider catalyst in that tension between the the uh, the Muslim areas and the French areas, essentially. And they then began rioting. They gave, then began massive uprising, smashing uh, windows, smashing cities, burning down places, going into tourist areas like Champs-Élysées in Paris, where, funny enough, I actually just was a few weeks ago with my wife and kids, uh, not at night, you know, we were there walking around in the daytime, but going into, you know, very, just out front of the Louvre in, in France, as well as some of, the, some of the cities down on the Riviera, like Marseille, like Nice, going through there and just wantonly smashing um, your, your designer districts, wantonly destroying cars, throwing petrol bombs at cars to set them on fire. And then you also had Antifa groups joining up, getting in the fight. And of course, uh, there's nothing the French love more than a little bit of a revolution. But what you're actually seeing are these immigrant communities going after the French. And, and I've seen people you know, trying to justify it by saying, well, you know, France had, had uh, conducted military operations against Algeria 500 years ago, and this is, True. Uh, you know, some kind, of, some kind of justification for that. This is retribution, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And it's like, you can go around and around the historical who invaded who, like, and like you said, man, my family's Polish, you know, we can, we can talk about, you know, how many times we've been invaded and occupied, but it, eventually that doesn't get you anywhere. And so uh, what you did see for at least the first week seemed to be completely wanton destruction to the point where the police union, the National Police Union of France said, if you don't order us, they went to Macron and basically gave him an ultimatum and said, and this came out publicly in an open letter to Macron, if you don't send us in there to reestablish the rule of law within France, then on, in three days time, we're gonna join the protesters and we're not even gonna show up to work at all. Macron immediately responded. And, and so Macron's no fan of mine because back in 2017, May of 17, like right before the election, I, uh, I actually leaked all of Macron's campaign emails and it became called the hashtag Macron leaks, <laughs> Drudge put it up, et cetera. And what we, what we discovered in these Are emails we were the direct contacts between the Macron campaign and a lot of these international uh, financial institutions, um, international banks that were in some cases directly funding and directly holding events for his campaign. I mean, of course, this is this is his background. He was an international banker, mm -hmm. and he then came into uh, came into politics. And I said, this is this is funny. Usually, you know, usually the uh, the bankers go and um, you know they find a campaign. You know, they find a guy to. Uh, uh, to go in and uh, and support, but in in this case, no, no, they just took one of their own guys and put them up. You're on Capitol Hill a lot. You're in the White House. Um, you know whether or not they keep guest lists for the White House. Presumably, they're supposed to. They may or may not oh, be. Jesus. What is your take on what's going you know where on? It's going. Oh it's, my you know God. where it's going. I can feel it going you know where it's hey, going. I want to talk about John Stewart. You want to talk about cocaine? I mean, I, I just want to just your take. You you got some inside information. Sure Will, here's the question. Here's the yeah. question. Will we ever know 
who allegedly left a little bit of a party favor behind in the White House? That's that's my question. Well, so what's what's interesting is that you know, obviously the White House keeps uh, keeps guest lists. Okay, they have they have an organization that that's in control of that. You may have heard of them. They're called the United States Secret Service. Oh, there yeah. is nobody who goes into the White House, whether it's a a tour group, whether it's a member of the press, whether it's whether it's a cleaning, you know, some some janitor or something. Every single person who goes through there is checked, or at least a peripheral check, or depending on how close you are to the West Wing and the president, you get a much deeper, uh, you get you get the full cavity search, right? Yeah. So uh, this idea that they wouldn't know who's in the White House at any given time, it's a joke, it's ridiculous. And then, the, and then the flip side of that is that, you know, you can find something in the White House, you know, a bag of drugs, whatever it is, and not be able to get biometrics off of it. Because I always look at this the other way, the, the thing they're not telling you here is when it comes to this, and let's say it's a bag of cocaine, because that's, that seems to be what everybody is, is claiming that it is at this point, is where is the CSI? Where mm -hmm. are the biometrics? Where are the fingerprints? Where is the touch DNA? Where's any of these analyses that clearly are within the scope of the United States Secret Service to have at their behest? And, and obviously Quantico is right down the road. If they really wanted to go to that level, I don't think they'd have to. But the idea that they're still at this point not telling us who it was. And by the way, I don't know if you saw that earlier today, they're starting to change the reported location of where it's found. Yeah, the library. I think there's three yeah, different yeah. locations we've been told at one point. Yep. Yeah. So first it was, you know, it was the, you know, the president's son with the bag of cocaine in the library. Like, <laughs> it was like clue, clue, yeah. Clue remake. <laughs> Um, yeah. And, but then it, but then it wasn't that, then it was the South entrance and now they're claiming, oh no, no, no. It's actually the, uh, you know, this, this other entrance where the vice president typically comes in and I said, oh, here we go. Passing the heat, passing it. They're going to pass it. They're going to try. And, and, and I think you might be seeing set up because they're in full spin mode now. That's what's going on. They're in full spin mode. What I actually thought would happen would be that, uh, Jill Biden would say, my husband, you know, is under a lot of stress. He's in public service for 50 years plus, and I don't want him to run. And they would wait to the last possible second to let a Democrat join there. Um, I had the privilege of having dinner with uh, RFK Jr. the other day. And uh, oh, cool. And quite honestly, I, I was pretty I was pretty impressed, actually. I, I He seems to be very level-headed. He uh, people are 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 staining him as an anti-vaxer, but he actually said to me. I mean, I was right next to him. He actually said, "I'm not an anti-vaxer. I'm not anti anything about that. What I am is I'm for choice, and I'm for disclosure, right?" And so, very rational guy. Um, seemed like, of course, that's the only connection I had to him. But I I just think the next 15 months are going to be crazy, and so I I, I but I, I, we're going to lose time, and I, yeah. I gotta uh, unfortunately. Um, I, I don't want to miss out on the John Stewart uh, U.S. Capitol thing. What, what the heck was that all about? What what happened with John Stewart and you? Okay, so so John Stewart was at the U.S. Capitol and and he was leading a number of other um, activists regarding a bill that had to do with the burn pits in Afghanistan and Iraq and the U.S. veterans who had been affected by the burn pits in Iraq. Now, the burn pits were essentially for uh, documents, information, many of it you know, classified information, that because you weren't able to take it from one uh, one forward operating base to another, that you would, you would set up these pits and, and you would literally burn it. Um, and then because there were people who were doing it so often in the same way, that you can get, you can get hearing damage, hearing impairment from being around loud noise constantly. Uh, it was the same type of situation because they were around the smoke from these burn pits, that black smoke. That they and and look, I had somebody in my unit who um, who was affected greatly by this. She she came off a of deployment and within about a year, her hair started falling out, her nails started falling out, um, toenails, fingernails, etc. Just huge, huge effect. Um, I have another buddy who's in the Marines who was affected by this. He can't, uh, his, his lungs were so affected that he can't even fly in an airplane anymore because he can't go over a certain altitude. The pressure just, just messes with him. So he can't do it, he's gotta drive everywhere. And you know, this isn't a real thing. So anyway, John Stewart comes down and John Stewart was blowing up saying, Republicans hate the vets. Republicans don't want the vets to get healthcare. Republicans don't care about the burn pits. 
And and I showed up to say, hey, man, I, I'm a Republican and a veteran who agrees with you that we should do something about the burn pits. But I point I wanted to point out and, and, and I attempted to, I, I suppose I did, that what he was doing was being a detriment to actually getting the bill across the finish line because you needed Republicans in the Senate to vote for this thing. And what he what was he doing? He was walking around and dropping bombs on everybody, blowing them up, saying Republicans hate veterans, Republicans don't want to do anything, blah, blah, blah. So when he sees me, you know, he just assumed that I was against the burn pit bill and started blowing getting in my face and, you know, what can I say? I'm going to stand my ground. So I stood my ground and I, I gave as good as I got from him. And uh, it actually got to the point, and I will say, even though we went back and forth and he's screaming and yelling profanities at my face, that we actually were able to have a conversation offline uh, where there was another individual, actually the guy who runs Grunt Style, came in, the, that's the veteran-led um, apparel line, you know, people know Grunt Style, and and he came in and said, look, you know, I think you guys got off on the wrong foot. I think you're both want the same thing. And then John Stewart actually apologized to me. But then I asked him, I said, John, you apologized to me off camera, but you attacked me on camera. Would you have the would you give me the respect of actually saying something on camera to me? And he said he would. So I, I uh, we were able to actually kind of shake hands and, and show that to the whole world and do. And I think do the right thing for veterans, whether look, you know, he's a guy who's on the left. I'm a guy who's on the right. But hopefully, like I was saying before, hopefully we can take something like veterans who have been uh, who have had their health impacted in the line of duty that we could put something like that beyond, you know, who's going to win and who's going to get credit for it. So I thought it was just a cool moment and I was happy to do it. 500 podcast. Human Events with Jack Posobiec, um, War Room with Bannon, The Charlie Kirk Show, In the Navy. How do you write three books? I, 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 w- yeah, I know you have a family. I, I know you're very active in what you're doing. Uh, uh, we're gonna put up a list of all the books you wrote, but obviously Citizens for Trump, The Inside Story, uh, People's Movement to Take Back America, 2017, uh, 40 Warfare, The Doctrine for the Next Generation of Politics, 2018, Antifa, um, stories, the inside black block 2021. Anything else going on where you have time to write another book? What's going on there? Uh, th- there have been discussions. Uh, Bannon keeps, uh, keeps poking me on that. He said, you know, you got to write, you know, you keep writing books about stuff that's already happened. You got to write books about the next big thing. And so, Jack, uh, if uh, Trump becomes 47 uh, from 45, uh, do you expect to be uh, at the White House? You expect to be in the cabinet? <laughs> um, you know, I'll put it this way. I, I, I really love what I do right now. Um, I really, like like you said before, you know, I've got um, got my hands in a lot of pots. I've got, I've got a show. I've got, we you know, we run humanevents.com, which then purchased the postmillennial.com. So definitely have my hands full with that stuff. And then having a family, having two little boys and, and a wife at home. But, you know, there, there are certain, you know, never say never. There are certain times where I get frustrated when I see, uh, when I see what China is doing to the United States, when I see what China is, is able to put over. And I think that, you know, coming from someone who has has lived in China, someone who studied Chinese, if there were you know, potentially an opportunity there to at least be a voice, I'd, I'd be more than happy to help. Um, if the president calls you though, I mean, you know, he's the president, right? I mean, that's hard to turn down, but I, I, uh, I'll leave that, we'll, we'll look forward to finding out what happens there. Um, I wanted to bring up a different topic to, to end on, and that is, have you seen this video that Joe Rogan plays? It's on social media where it has one newscaster saying, we as a country can't afford fake fake news, and then it goes to the next newscaster, and it's the next newscaster, and it's like the, the commercial from the 70s, and so on and so on, and you see like 100 channels all saying the same thing. Sharing of biased and false, false news has, has become, become all too common, common on, on social, social media. media. More alarming, some media Unfortunately, some members of the media use their, their platforms to push their, their own personal bias and agenda to control exactly, exactly what people think. And this is extremely dangerous to our democracy. 
And then you are told that there really wasn't a Hunter Biden laptop and it was a Russian disinformation campaign. And it turned out to be completely true. But we were all told by every news source that it was bullshit. I mean, I'm just gonna call it what it is. Um, that to me is the most frightening internal thing going on. When I saw that, you know, every channel saying the same thing where they were all giving, and it wasn't just like CBS and NBC and Fox, it was like a bunch of, it was, there were tons of different news channels. Um, I, I don't know wh what the question is other than, is that not scary as hell? I mean, I, when I think of that, there's somebody, something behind that. And do you have any idea what that is? Because you, you have a, I mean, I, I can't even understand as an American citizen how if, if, if you heard that, I don't care if you're Democrat or Republican, if you're a Democrat and you're on that side and allegedly that, that was, you know, uh, them saying it was a Russian disinformation campaign and it was 100% true, how is an American, regardless of what your political stance is, that you can stand for you getting disinformation. We were all told that the Biden laptop wasn't real. We were all told uh, a bunch of things that were conspiracies that turned out to be true. I, what, is, what in the world is happening and why is that happening, Jack? Well, I, I think what's happening is very clear is that, you know, and it's, it's basically the first topic that we talked about today. It's, it's that you're, we're now living in the decline of legacy media and the rise of independent media, the rise of independent voices, which is really a democratization of information. And so the ability now that we've seen of independent voices, independent actors, people outside the mainstream being willing to break free of this um, Hunter Biden's hard drive, the very first place anyone ever heard of that was, as you just said, Steve Bannon's war room, right? That was the first place they heard about it. Then boom, New York Post has the article, it's all out there. And I think that beyond, you know, left and right, beyond Republican, Democrat, what you're actually seeing is a disconnect between people who are free thinkers, critical thinkers, and then people who are followers, people who were... Look, and, and I'm not one of those guys who says that COVID was, was, you know, didn't exist. I think COVID did exist. I think it was cooked up in that lab in, in Wuhan. I think the Chinese Communist Party has never been forthcoming about what its true purpose was. But I do think that that's something that was manufactured for sure. And when it was released, uh, people were asked, you know, what was happening there. And, and again, we were all told it was disinformation to simply ask the question about where this virus came from and how it affected all of us. And so when you look all the way back to 2020, now through the history, right, through the, our ability to have hindsight onto this, we realize how much we were lied to. We realize how much we've been lied to. And it's people who just are using basic critical thinking uh, factors to be able to decide how we are going to act versus people who stayed in their homes, perfectly healthy people who stayed in their homes for a year because the TV told them to. And they didn't think about it beyond, there are people, I still, I fly around now, I still see people with masks on. I still see perfectly oh, yeah. healthy people with, with masks on. And I say, guys, you know, you don't have to do these things just because the guy on the TV told you. Well, Jack, um, we're super grateful you're on the show. Uh, I know you got a lot going on. Um, I don't think it's the, the I, I know this is not gonna, it's gonna, this is an inside joke with my wife, but like it's no longer the six degrees of Kevin Bacon. I'll go with uh, six degrees of Jack's uh, Pasobic or six degrees of Todd Alt. I'm just kidding around. Um, but uh, I, I appreciate you, this is fun. I had a good time, no, I'm serious. Like, you know, it's funny, cause I know, I, I, I know people that know him. I was just with someone who really likes Jack, but I would never say who that was, but high up in the Republican party. And you, it's weird to see sort of the connection and dynamics around what's happening and like minds going around. Obviously, Jack, we thank you for your time. We're gonna put up your books and everything and hopefully you'll be back again. God bless Todd, thanks, appreciate it, man. Take care, buddy.
Yeah, you got it right.